Ja. Okay, hello again. Um, here we are continuing uh, with our pathophysiology of congenital heart disease. So we are our talks today about pathophysiology of left to right shunts. We've talked already about the VSD, the PDA, and we're going to talk now about the ASD uh, pathophysiology. So what is an ASD? It's an atrial septal defect. This is the interatrial septum. It has a lower part, an upper part, and we call the secundum, the primum. Regardless, it's just an ASD, atrial septal defect. That means we can have a hole or a defect in the cavity, in the uh, wall. And this is how it would be. So let's follow again in pathophysiology of the heart, follow the blood and make sense of following the blood and know the rules of what blood does to the area it goes to with pressure or without and then you really know the pathophysiology in a very easy way. So IVC flow, SVC flow going to right atrium, right ventricle, up to the pulmonary artery, to the lungs, oxygenated, back into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, the four pulmonary veins, two on the right and two on the left. And we have now the left flow and into the left ventricle, this is normal and gets ejected through the aorta, which I didn't draw, just for the sake of explaining the ASD. So as we said, let's follow the blood now. The RV has, has received its cardiac output. It has ejected it into the pulmonary arteries. It got oxygenated. Now it came back through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. The blood now has two choices to go through through the mitral to the LV, but now we have a hole here. So there is also a chance that the blood can go from the left to the right, left atrium to the right atrium through the atrial septal defect. So how will that happen? Again, blood follows resistance, pressure, uh, easy to go, compliance, and that's how it likes to go. The least, the best compliant area, the least resistant, the least pressure will receive the extra blood. We know that the right atrial pressure is slightly lower than the left atrial pressure. They are not so different, but maybe two or three millimeter mercury difference. We know that the right ventricle pressure is much lower than the left side. And we know that the, sorry, the right ventricle is much lower than the left side. And we know that the muscle wall of the right ventricle is quite thin and soft. And the PAs or the PA pressure, the pulmonary artery pressure is also low with a low resistance. So the blood, Going to the LV, which is more thick muscle, less soft, less compliant ventricle. And now it has the choice to go to a lower pressure, a more compliant ventricle. You think we will have a left right shunt? Obviously, yes, because of lower pressure and more compliance in the area of the right side, namely the right ventricle with lower resistance in the pulmonary arteries. And this causes a left to right shunt during what? Systole or diastole? There is not much a big difference in systole and diastole pressure wise in between the two atria. You see a normal uh, mean uh, LA pressure would be probably around six to eight. 
with a normal mean RA pressure of around what? Two to six. So they meet in that six area. And this is the mean pressure. And because of that, the shunt will happen from the higher pressure side to the lower pressure side. And in diastole, it almost does not happen because the pressures are almost, almost equal. So this shunt will happen mostly in systole, left to right. And because there is no much difference in terms of volume and contraction and pressure on the right sided atrium, the right side atrium, though it is supposedly receiving the shunt in systole of the atria, but because systole of the atria is not uh, uh, um, a strong systole, it does not have, the walls do not have significant uh, content of muscle, then the right atrium does dilate because of the left to right shunt in systole from the left atrium to the right atrium. But the right ventricle will also, so I wouldn't say but, the right ventricle will also receive this during uh, diastole from the atria to the ventricle. And here it's very easy to say that the right ventricle will actually dilate. Because again, by the rule we said, the chamber that, dil does, that dilates is the chamber that receives the volume during diastole. So the first pathophysiological effect is dilated right atrium and dilated right ventricle because of this right to left shunt. Obviously, again, because of the pressure being almost all equal and because the cardiac output received by the right atrium and the right ventricle is more than usual, than normal, then the pulmonary artery will also receive the additional cardiac output in the same low pressure, low systolic ejection uh, pressure, and the pulmonary artery will also dilate. So a feature in left to right shunt of the ASD is dilatation of the left, uh, sorry, right atrium, dilatation of the right ventricle, and dilatation of the main pulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary arteries. Obviously, we will have increased pulmonary blood flow, increased pulmonary vascular marking on the x-ray, or just normal. Uh, ASD, whether small, uh, small for sure, it will not shunt too much, moderate or large, uh, you cannot predict exactly that it, because it's moderate or because it's large, it's going to shunt a lot. We can say in general, it will shunt a lot, but predict exactly no, because the compliance of the RV will be the governor of how much blood is accepted and how much blood is ejected to the pulmonary arteries. And hence we may find actually, or we, we do find, most patients with ASD are asymptomatic or so-and-so, quote-unquote, cold, asymptomatic. Probably if we stress them enough, if we ask more deeper questions, we may find some uh, symptomatology of, um, um, uh, of ASD patients that are not obvious uh, otherwise. So we got the dilatation effect, the increased pulmonary uh, uh, flow again. So blood now goes increased flow to the lungs and goes back to the left atrium. Now the left atrium, is it seeing too much blood now? Because the pulmonary arteries did see too much blood. Yes and no, it will see too much blood, but again, that too much blood will escape back to the ASD and back to the PA. Actually, some of its own blood will also go there. And hence, in large ASDs or moderate to large ASDs, we actually may see the reverse that the left atrium either is truly smaller or looks smaller because it's compressed by the more dilated um, 
uh, right uh, atrium. But again, one feature could be a smaller left side in ASD uh, patients because of less flow going to the uh, left side. This is uh, number two. So the increased pulmonary outflow, what is the uh, incidence that they would have truly pulmonary arteriolar edema? That's extremely rare. And I think we don't know exactly why the shunt is not, although it can be large, three to one, but probably because there is a ventricle between the shunt and the PA, and that ventricle controls what blood go, one, and because this shunt is not a high pressure shunt, does not occur with pressure, like a moderate to large PDA or a moderate to large VSD. So the symptomatology are less, the effect on the patient is much less. What could we see uh, more of pathophysiology? Can we see pulmonary hypertension with ASDs, with pulmonary, fixed pulmonary uh, vascular uh, resistance? That's actually extremely rare pathophysiology to see. You don't see that with uh, ASDs as a rule. But in the very rare occasion, there are ASDs that are called actually malignant ASDs, where PA pressure elevates so quickly early in life, within the first year of life, with the ASD. And as we learn more, that actually some of these patients, it's not just the effect of the ASD, it's actually they do have what we call associated primary pulmonary hypertension with congenital heart disease. So be careful when you evaluate an ASD that has a right to left shunt. It looks like a reverse. It looks like Eisenbinger syndrome and call it just because of the ASD effect and the shunt effect. Actually, those patients may be the other way around. They are primary pulmonary hypertension patients with an associated ASD that they need to decompress the right side because of uh, the high pressure. One other pathophysiological effect is because of the significant, this is a venous chamber with not much pressure, it tends to dilate much more than a systemic chamber. So we do see quite a bit of severe dilatation of the right atrium and the right ventricle with the consequence of different atrial uh, tachy arrhythmias or brady arrhythmias as, as one of the pathophysiological effects of an ASD uh, on the right side. Uh, very rarely, very rarely, extremely rarely that it will cause ventricular arrhythmia because of right ventricular uh, dilatation. It's mostly atrial arrhythmias, fl uh, fl atrial flutter in a late presenter uh, large ASD that has been left for many years is actually a common finding. Tricuspid valve regurgitation because of significant annular, tricuspid annulus dilatation is also uh, seen and can be worse in patients who start to develop uh, pulmonary hypertension with uh, ASDs. Um, another uh, finding, we, uh, a pathophysiological effect that we actually may have a uh, sort of a low cardiac output state on the left side because of a huge uh, left to right shunt. Sometimes even to the extent that the left side structures, as I said, the left atrium may look small, the left ventricle may look small, that even sometimes the aorta, ascending aorta, isthmus and coarctation area may actually become smaller or small enough to cause obstructive uh, lesions uh, into them. Um, an ASD is usually asymptomatic, whether small, large, uh, moderate or large. When we say an ASD that is uh, small, we're talking about six millimeter or less. When we say moderate, we're talking about probably uh, six to eight, around six to 10, and more than 10 millimeter would be considered as a large ASD. ASD is usually uh, uh, close uh, spontaneously when they are small, 
moderate to large ASDs tend to uh, stay uh, there for uh, a longer time. So to recap, it is a left to right shunt. It dilates the right side of the heart. It causes increased pulmonary blood flow, rarely causes pulmonary hypertension as a, effect, a pathophysiological uh, effect. Um, it can cause atrial arrhythmias because of significant atrial dilatation because of the left uh, to right shunt. Symptomatology, most of these ASD patients are actually uh, asymptomatic. Uh, ASDs presenting very early with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. One should always be careful that this could be the other way around. It's primary pulmonary hypertension with congenital heart disease, not Eisenmenger, and the ASD can shunt to right, uh, right to left. But Eisenmenger syndrome is a complication of left to right shunts whether it's a VSD or a PDA and an ASD, and that's why the effect of such shunt, if, import, if the shunt is important, has to be obliterated. We have to close ASDs that are large enough at a certain uh, age, and we have to close the VSDs and the PDAs that remain uh, to the certain age, weight, and time uh, that's indicated. Uh, by this, I finish uh, ASD uh, pathophysiology.